I want to begin with a statement that may surprise some of you at least, but I believe the Bible is a book that is intended to be understood. Making that statement, let me read it again. The Bible is a book that is intended to be understood. Some of you may be thinking, well, hold on, preacher. Have you spent any time lately in Leviticus or Revelation? Yes, there are parts of the scriptures that are more difficult, that take more effort than others. But I believe that God intends for us to get it. Yes, there are some parts that take some explaining. But God desires to communicate. I'm going to remind you of some verses in places like Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19 and verse 7. Psalmist says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Again, I believe it's God's desire to communicate. The truly crucial concepts in Scripture are plain enough for all who are willing to know. All who are willing to know can know. I think that's what Jesus was trying to convey as he spoke in, during his ministry in places like John chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. John 7, 16 and 17, it says, So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. I realize there Jesus isn't talking about the Bible itself, but Jesus's words would go on to be recorded in the scriptures that God intended for us to study, the holy writings of God. And again, perhaps it's more a matter of, of willingness sometimes that uh, we think some parts are more difficult than others. But once again, I believe God intends for us to understand Again, these crucial concepts, the things that are top shelf, if you will, as far as what God is trying to convey to a lost and dying world, are plain enough. Salvation is one of those crucial topics that are clearly and simply taught in many places in the Bible. And one of those places is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. That's going to be the focus of our study <clears throat> this morning. If you want to open your Bibles there and follow along. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 is one of those places where I think the idea, the concept of salvation is plainly taught, plainly described. In that section of his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul looks at salvation from three different angles. First of all, Paul is going to deal with what we are saved from. Then he talks about who and what we are saved by. And then finally, near the end, he says, or he discusses what we are saved for. So again, looking at this topic from three different angles, let's look at what Paul had to teach about salvation and, and see just really how simple it is from that vantage point. We start by talking about what we are saved from. Paul deals with that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, <clears throat> Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we, all, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So Paul begins this discussion of salvation by describing the terrible state we were in before being saved. Everyone starts there. No one is physically born saved, although, uh, you know, it, I guess the infants, of course, are you know, not lost till they participate in sin <clears throat> as well. But talking about those who are responsible before God Everyone is in this state that Paul describes. And it's not very uh, pleasant things to talk about, is it? 
One reason some are not interested in salvation is that they think, they don't think they need saving. And that's one of the problems. They may think to themselves something like, well, I'm not too bad of a guy. I do some good things. I'm, I'm not as bad as so-and-so over there. So we start to make those comparisons. So again, part of the struggle comes in maybe understanding or submitting to God's call of salvation by just not really realizing or refusing to face the fact that we are sinners. In chapter one of Ephesians, Paul, Paul spends nearly the entire chapter extolling the virtues of God and Christ. Some amazing writing from the pen of Paul by the inspiration of God. And I would encourage you to, to read that a little bit later. We're not going to spend time there, but over and over again, Paul praises God and praises Christ and talks about the blessings found in Christ. But the tone changes as Paul moves into chapter two in his letter. We read these first three verses just a moment ago. The Ephesian Christians prior to coming to Christ, and we by extension, were a complete sinful mess. Once again, think back to what we read there or look in your scriptures and notice the descriptive terms used to describe those outside of Christ, those who were lost. We find things in verses one through three like dead in trespasses and sins living in the sinful world around us. We were living according to the dictates of the devil and his team, right? Did you catch that there? Verse two, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We were living according, living, if you will, like the devil. We were also indulging the lustful desires of our physical cravings. If we think carefully about it, that's what we devoted ourselves to. With, without a higher power with a call in our life, we live for ourselves, don't we? And Paul highlights it there in verse 3. Rather than children of God, Paul ends verse 3 by saying, we were practicing children of wrath. That's the idea there when he says, by nature, we were children of wrath, even as the rest. Dead full of sin, following the devil, uh, giving into lustful desires and, and living in opposition to God. Once again, that's not a very flattering description by any measure, is it? But it is reality. And Paul's not cutting any corners. He's not pulling any punches. Without Christ, we are all of these things and more. There's no reason to sugarcoat it, and Paul doesn't here. Very plainly in this discussion of salvation, he says there's something we need to be saved from, and it is the sin and trespasses that have separated us, separated us from God. So Paul vividly reminds the Ephesian believers of what they were saved from. Uh, these, believe, these were believers, of course, so they, they aren't in that place anymore, but a discussion of salvation has to start there. Here. And teaching them about salvation, he's again just reminding them of where they were at one point in their life. But Paul moves on in the text, starting in verse 4, to remind them of who and what saved them. Again, looking back in their life, who and what were the vision and vision believers, and us by extension for believers now, who and what were we saved by? Let me read verses 4 through 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as the result of works, that no one may boast. So just as it is common to think we are not so bad before being saved, it's also common to think that once we are saved, that somehow we can take the credit for it. <clears throat> but nothing, according to Paul, could be farther from the truth. 
Paul here in verses four through nine clearly sets forth who and what saves us from the mess that we were in. In these verses, verses four through nine, the emphasis is solidly on God, his gifts, and what he accomplishes for us in Christ. Again, let me rehearse some of what we just read a moment ago. First of all, again, God and Christ are mentioned over and over again in these six verses. God did this. Christ was the one that God was working through over and over again. We see that. Then we see listed all of, of God's gifts that he shares. Did you catch that? Let me remind you in verse four, we were, Paul tells us about God's mercy. Then in verse four as well, we learn of love. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Then grace, of course, is mentioned here. God's grace in verses 7 and 8. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And then verse 7, of course, mentions God's kindness. The surpassing riches of his grace and kindness. So once again, God, several of God's gifts to us are mentioned here. Mercy, love, grace, and kindness. But not only do we find these gifts mentioned, but we also read here of, of many of God's actions on our behalf. In verse 5, the text tells us that God made us alive together with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. That's something God did, not us. Verse 6 tells us that God raised us up with him. We were raised up with Christ, and he raised us up. Then he tells us God seated us with him, with Christ in the heavenly places. Again, who's doing what? God's doing it. And finally, in verse 7, we read of God showing the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness. God raised us up and seated us with Christ so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. It's by virtue of what God did in the times to come that it, it exhibits what God has done and has given by his gift. And if all this wasn't enough to make the point, Paul then clearly and repeatedly excludes human effort from the equation, right? We've seen positively Paul saying, it's by God's gift, it's by God's action. But several times here in these few verses, Paul excludes us from the equation. He says in verse 8, you have been saved, not you are saving yourself. Do you remember that? For great, by grace, you have been saved. We were acted upon, not acting for ourselves. In verse 8, he also says, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not by our work, it's by God's work. It's not by our actions, it's by God's actions. It's God's gift, not a gift to ourselves. Then finally, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. How much plainer could Paul say it? You see, the who of salvation is God, not us. The only sense in which we are involved is in the fact that we must accept the gift of salvation that God offers by faith. That was in verse 8 as well. For you've been saved by grace through faith. It's our faith that reaches out and accepts what God offers. Salvation then is granted to us. We don't earn it. God is the who of salvation. Not us, and, and it couldn't be any clearer than Paul says it here. <clears throat> but there's another facet of salvation and another angle of salvation that we can view it that's part of Paul's discussion here in Ephesians 2. He's talked about what we are saved from, our sin and transgressions, and he's talked about who we are saved by, and that's God. Teaching isn't complete, though, until we understand what we are saved for. And that's the last verse in our text. What are we saved for? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
You see, we are saved for a purpose. The Ephesians, Paul is telling them, you were saved for a purpose. And by extension, as a believer, we have the same responsibility. We are saved for a purpose. Yes, salvation restores our relationship with God, which was destroyed by sin. Praise God, we are blessed to be in fellowship with him once again. But as good as that is, and it is tremendously good, salvation doesn't stop there. The process, if you will, doesn't end when we leave the baptistry. Let's rehearse what Paul said there in verse 10. Once again, Paul emphasizes God's work, not ours, doesn't he? He says there, for we are his workmanship. <clears throat> Couldn't be plainer. Couldn't be simpler. As Christians, we are not self-made individuals, are we? It's almost as if Paul knew he had to say it over and over and over again for us to get it. Then, of course, Paul highlights what God intends for saved or recreated people to do. And what is it? We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, that's a broad term. I believe it's by design. It's a broad term that allows for each saved person's varied, various abilities, right? Paul doesn't give just a, a list of what good works are. We're to learn what we're able to do in the kingdom of God and then do it. But every Whatever good thing you can do to bring honor and glory to God and help another, do it as a saved person. This, again, highlights our gratitude for what God has done. We, at that point, try to participate in God's kingdom work. It's what, we, again, we were designed. It's what we were saved to do. Finally, Paul notes that doing good is to be a lifelong practice. We are to walk in them. Did you catch that right at the end of verse 10? Speaking of these good works, it says, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk or live in them. That's the idea here. Our work as a saved person is never done in that sense. From our first steps as a new believer to the day that we draw our final breath, we should be involved in one way or another in God's work. That's a, that's a, a tall calling, isn't it? It's, a, it's a, an important one. There are seasons in life where maybe we we're more effective than others, but again, we're to walk in this lifestyle of service to God and, and helping others. So while salvation is certainly a grand and glorious thing, and it's highlighted over and over again in Scripture, Paul and Peter and the other apostles praise God for his salvation, and rightly so. But while salvation certainly is a grand and glorious thing, it is really very simple when you consider it. God has provided a way for you to be saved from your sins. God has done everything necessary to make it available to you. God has something for you to do as a saved person. Those are what we talked about today. It's what Paul talked about in Ephesians 2. It's all about God, his willingness and, and desire to work through us. <clears throat> Again, our role, if you want to put it that way, as Paul highlighted in verse 8, was to put our faith in God and in his son who he sent to save us. It's by faith in what God has done that our sins can be forgiven. It's by faith in what God has done you can receive the benefits of God's grace. Of course, it's by faith in what God has done you can be part of what God is doing in the world. I would encourage you, as we draw our thoughts to our close in this lesson, is to respond to God in faith. If you're not a Christian, as we talked about earlier, you're in a terrible state of separation from God. Your sins have separated you from the God who created you. God desires to have a relationship with you, but that's a choice that has to be made by faith. You need to turn to God in faith. Of course, the pattern we see over and over again in Scripture, those who come to believe in what God has done and are wanting to be saved, in faith they repented, by faith, 
They confessed the name of Jesus, and by faith they were immersed into Christ and began that walk with God. If you're not a believer, I would encourage you to think carefully about taking those steps. God doesn't desire for anyone to be lost, but for all to come to repentance. And that's his call for you. But if you are a Christian, let me encourage you to stay steadfast in your faith. Let me encourage you to be thankful to God that your sins have been forgiven and that God has done everything necessary to make that salvation possible. Let me encourage you in, with an ongoing faith to continually be involved in the work of the Lord in whatever way possible. Uh, benefit others around you by the power of God. Share the message that has benefited you with them. God bless. Have a great rest of your week.